Hi, I'm Roy Collin, the host of the podcast. You can find everything about me by scanning the QR code there or going to RoyCollin.com and you'll find my six podcasts, the Podfather Helping People Become Podcasters, the Awakening Exposing Fraud and Corruption But With Solutions, the Crypto, All Things Blockchain Technology, Meditation Podcast, Speaking Podcast, and the Learn Polish Podcast. You can also help the show by actually making a donation, visiting the store, or helping my sponsors. I hope you enjoyed this week's show. Welcome to the Speaking Podcast. You can find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. My guest today, in Atlanta, the USA, founder and CEO of Scale Architects. He spent the last decade helping to launch and scale nearly 20,000 new businesses and nonprofits, which seems kind of a bit strange, that massive number, but we'll find out. Please welcome Scott Ritzheimer, or as he said himself, Hi, well, it's hi, Mart, is it, with a H, kind of at the start. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Right, thanks so much for having me. It's just a pleasure to be here. Uh, that is an absolutely outrageous number. Uh, I, I had to check it a few times because, like, really? We did that many? And uh, did I start all those by myself? Absolutely not. No one could possibly do that. Uh, but what my uh, what I and my team did uh, was for a period of, it was a little longer than 10 years, um, but a period of 13, 14 years, we help launch uh, brand new businesses, brand new nonprofits, uh, all kinds of organizations across the U.S. And there are a lot of things are just the right, right spot, right time, right? We we owned a couple of really, really great Google AdWords when like Google AdWords was the thing. You know, it was pre-social media. If you wanted to find something online, you did it at Google. And anyone who tried to find, you know, how to start up, fill in the blank, they found us. And, uh, and so we just had the opportunity to be right there at the ground level, very, very beginning part of the process for all these thousands of organizations. Uh, the early days was a few hundred, toward the end it was a few thousand, and you average it all out, we're somewhere around 15, 1,500 a year uh, we helped launch. And when you see something happen that many times, uh, of course, there were failures in that, right? It's not that every single one of those was a success story. Uh, if you if you look at it as every one of those learned something, right, there was a tremendous amount of success in that. But in the way that we define, you know, loosely define success and failure, the, the organizations, some of them made it. Some of them just they, they didn't make it. They had to wrap up and, and, and move on and try something else. And when you see, again, it happen at that scale, you see a lot of them not work. You see a lot of them do work. And uh, I just had this really tremendous opportunity. This is all happening in my early and, and mid-20s, into my late 20s. I just had the opportunity to see this pattern play out again and again and, and start looking at it and saying, hey, why are some of these work? Why are some of these founders just taking off? Uh, and why is it that some of them are getting stuck? Why is it that some of them start with a bang you know, have tremendous progress at the beginning and then just hit a wall uh, a few years later when it, it seems like everything's going good. And uh, a, a, as I'm kind of watching it happen at scale, I'm also experiencing it firsthand. And, and that's where some of those lessons really started to hit home was when I found myself having the same challenges that some of our, our, our clients did. And I, I took all of that uh, and just last year, I was finally able to put it all together and synthesize it into what I, I discovered are seven different stages that founders go through, right? It, one of the challenges for founders is that they are founder and CEO for their entire time at a business, right? Uh, and the same thing for a nonprofit. But in the business world, we'll just use that language. Uh, you're founder and CEO from the day you make your first business card. Uh, whereas if you're uh, an employee kind of rising through the ranks, as you progress to higher levels of responsibility, higher levels of leadership, bigger challenges, you tend to get a new title at each of those stages, right? You go from being a frontline worker to a line manager. Now your, your title says manager. And, and frankly, that's a hard transition for a lot of people to make, but at least it makes sense that it's happening. Right. When you didn't have to manage anybody, now your job description says you have to manage. There's new skills that are needed to be a good manager. It's not just about being a great performer. But for founders, nobody ever tells them that their title has changed. Right. No one ever tells them that they need to change the way that they need to start showing up. Nobody ever tells them when it's the right time to develop a managerial skill set or a leadership skill set, or to really step into the actual CEO seat, 
And, and so what happens is each of those transition points are invisible. And so founders find themselves getting stuck at these transition points because they don't know they're happening. They're, they're employing the, the skill set that got them here and, and, and they're feeling the, the pushback against it. And so they double down on those skills when in fact what they need to do is change their skill set, adapt a new methodology, and they'll see growth come very quickly after that. Like a lot of the time, I think the ego gets in the way because when a company scales up, sometimes the guy that started it isn't necessarily the best person to bring it to the next level when it's actually getting into the, you know, like the eight figure kind of thing. What's the best way for somebody to kind of realize that? Because sometimes it's hard and they could actually be the problem. Oh yeah, they're always the problem, right? Uh, but I would, I would push back and say it's not always ego. And, and when it is ego, it's not always not justified. So here's what happens. And this is why this framework is so helpful because I think that the idea of am I the person to lead this forward is often misguided, right? It, it's actually going at a symptom of the issue, not the root of the issue. I have seen so many founders that folks would write off and say, hey, they could never run a hundred million dollar company. I've seen them make the transition. I've seen them understand what they have to do to change work hard at those changes and lead $100 million organizations. So uh, I, I don't think it's a DNA thing. I don't think it's a baked in thing. I think you're right. Ego plays a really big role in it. But why is that ego given the room to get in the way? And, and it's usually that the difference for the founder who can make that transition and get to eight figures or the difference that someone else would bring in as a professional CEO they're actually adapting. It's the same skill set. What's different, though, is that the founder who's there, who's bumping up against that threshold, didn't need that skill set before. In fact, they created the success that they have today by not embracing that skill set. Right. So it's not necessarily that it's just ego, which, again, is a huge part of the puzzle. It's also that they have all this history of success that came through completely different strategies. There's a, an analogy I like to give that, that really goes to the heart of this. So here in the U.S., we like football. You could make the same kind of story for just about any, oh, American football, I should say. But you could make the same story for just about any sport. Uh, so uh, it's, you know, it's, it's playoff season here in the U.S. for, for football. It's the big championship for the end of the year. And so let's imagine it's the championship game. Uh, and, and your team has to get the ball into the end zone. That's the goal. That's the win. And if you get there, you win. If you don't get there, you lose. You've only got one play to do it left because the clock is ticking down and, and you've got to get it. You've got to get it in. So you make it in, you win. You don't make it in, you lose. And you know, just the play to call, you tell everybody what to do. And, uh, and, and then it, it hits you that something's really different this time. Instead of being the one who gets to take the ball and make it happen, you are now a coach on the sideline. You've done your part. You, the, the best you can do is hope that you trained uh, your folks well enough that you called the right play and that they're going to be able to do their job. And so the play starts, it's working, uh, and, and everything's going to plan. It's like my, you're, you're measuring everything in nanoseconds, right? It's just like time feels like it stands still. And then you realize one of the players isn't going to be where they need to be. Uh, they're, they're not going to make the catch that they need to make to get the ball into the end zone. And so without a moment's hesitation, you just take off, right? The headset that we wear goes flying. The clipboard you know, hits one of the assistant coaches. You're running down the sideline as fast as you can. And, and at the very last moment, you dive like you've never dove before and you make the catch. And if you were a player and you did that, it would make the news reel for like a decade, right? Just amazing. But because you were the coach and you violated that sideline, you crossed the boundary, not only is it not a catch, it's a penalty. Not only did you not win for your team, you guaranteed your team would lose. Not only is your team not celebrating you, they're frustrated by you and embarrassed by your response. And, and never in the history of, of professional football or for what I understand any other sport has this happened at that level, you know, where a coach has violated that sideline, come onto the field to make it happen. 
But I can tell you from working with founders and owners, it happens every single day. What has to happen, we have to transition to being that coach on the sideline. We can't muscle the ball through. We can't make our organizations grow. We can't do it all. We can't jump in and save the day every time something goes wrong. Otherwise, we will. Do, our very best people will get frustrated. They'll get burned out. They'll feel undermined. And the symptom that we face is we're exhausted, right? You run like that. You dive like that. You're going to be really, really sore and you lost the next day. But if you know your role as coach on the sideline, if you can understand inside a business context what the appropriate sidelines are, what are the boundaries that you should not cross, how do you lead from your side of the boundary, what you'll find is that CEO who's just maxed out, whose ego is on uh, explosion mode because they're stressed and they're tired and they're trying to save the day all the time, when they recognize their true role, uh, when they start to embrace the skill set that's needed in that role, you see all of that intensity dialed down, all that negative intensity dialed down. And and they still have to overcome the ego thing, yeah? But what you'll find is that the ego plays much less role when they have clarity, when they have clarity on what their role should actually be. Like, based on what you just kind of said, a lot of kind of owners... They micromanage or else, especially starting off, you know, depending on the size as they're building, because they go, I can do this better. And by the time I explain it to you, I would have it done. And they end up doing so much more and they hire the wrong people. But what's the best way when people are micromanaging to kind of stop doing that? Because I know that can be detrimental to any business. It's a hundred percent. It's a hundred percent. And and to be fair, most founders are not wired to be micromanagers, right? And again, this is where this is where these stages are so helpful. What's happening is they they started their business, they cut their teeth, they they generated enough success to bring in other players by by doing those things really well, by being the best salesperson or being the best consultant or being the best engineer or making the best decisions, whatever it may be. They, they worked really, really hard to refine that skill set. And the only way that they were able to get to the point where they'd have people to manage in the first place as a founder is by doing those things really well. So, you know, is it true that they do those things better? Maybe, maybe not. Is it true that they do those things well? Yes. And history says to succeed in business, right, with the limited history that they have, you have to be able to do these things well. If it's, if it's to be, it's up to me. And, and this is one of those invisible boundary lines that we cross when we move from winning by being the star player, getting stuff done, saving the day, to winning by being what I call the captain on the field. By, by learning that when you bring people around you, I usually say it's when you've hired a handful, right? Somewhere between five and 10 people, you will feel the, the, the dials kind of tick over. And, and at that stage, it's not just about how good you are. If you're the best salesperson, that doesn't matter anymore. What matters is, can you manage a sales team? And, and there's not a founder that I've met that has ever started their business so that they can manage people, right? It, it's, just, it's just not in their wiring. That's, that's the last thing that they want to do. In fact, I've met a, 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 a ton of founders who left their business because of the way they were being managed. Right, who left their other work or their employment and went and started their own business was because they didn't like being micromanaged. They didn't like having someone loom over them. So they they know that. They put that on others and and they think they don't want to be managed either. But the reality of it is not everyone's wired like a founder. Folks need good management. They don't need micromanagement. Folks need good management. They don't need you to just, you know, abdicate, throw stuff in their direction and then walk away. And, and where founders struggle and why they end up micromanaging is because they don't have, they haven't developed the skill set of how to manage effectively because they haven't recognized that that's the, that's the key ingredient to success at that stage. What I see with a lot of uh, kind of startups, when they end up kind of walking away from a job and doing twice as many hours with half the salary. <laughs> But they get to a stage where they're kind of, you know, they're able to survive. 
but they're putting in so much hours. But they don't have the the the, the amount of money to hire the first employee. And I know there's kind of this systems now where people are kind of coming and they do ten hours or whatever. But what's your advice for the person that's kind of on the fence, thinking they're taking food off their own table by bringing in whoever they need for the this, the first employees? Yep. It, it it comes down to, and this is probably it might not be the answer that you think, but it comes down to vision, right? Uh, and and this is a really critical point because if you're trying to build something that's bigger than you, then you, you're going to have to hire somebody at some point, right? You're going to have to make that decision at some point, and now is the best time to do it. Uh, if, if you're okay being a solopreneur, maybe having a 10-hour person helping you out, if you can achieve the vision that you have for your company that way, then don't sweat it, right? Like, don't hire the other person. And so what happens is we really struggle with that. We, we struggle to make the sacrifice to bring somebody else on because we don't have the vision to overcome the comfortability of our current income. And, and, and once you start to, to really get a clear vision for, hey, I don't just want to be a hairdresser. I want to build a salon. I want to build a chain of hair salons, right? I don't want to just be a roofer. I want to run a roofing company. Then what happens is all of that creativity and drive and innovation that's just core to who you are, it starts to get deployed into creative ways of bringing that first person on to help you out. And, and it usually is something creative, right? It usually is like, hey, I can only pay you for five hours a week, but you know, let's do this. If it works, we'll go to 10 and then we'll go to 15. Uh, and, and so the very, very first thing is you have to decide is, is it necessary to hire other employees to achieve my vision? Because if it isn't, then just in, you know, eat the money, you know, eat, eat it, you know, it's, it, and enjoy it. Don't, don't feel bad about that. Uh, there are lots of folks who are making lots of money and they're largely doing it on their own and they love it. But if your vision says uh, it's got to be more, then it's your job as a founder to to then take that creativity and that initiative that you have and apply it. Now, what I've found is that doesn't tend to be, once they have a vision for it, it doesn't tend to be the creativity of bringing somebody in. It's that second point that you talked about, uh, or, or it was a point you talked about earlier, if they bring in the wrong people. The, the, what we tend to go out and do is we think, I need someone who's more detail-oriented than me, right? Founders are not inherently detail-oriented people. I mean, as a, as a general rule, there are obviously lo lots of exceptions to that. But as a general rule, they tend to be more idea-oriented. They tend to be more big-picture thinkers. They tend to be more kind of enthusiastic and fast-moving. And they tend to drop the ball on getting stuff done, right? The, the, the peak moment for the endorphin rush for most founders is the moment they have the idea. Actually implementing the idea isn't anywhere near as fun. And so they, they, they look for someone who is more detail-oriented than them. And, and that's intuitively correct. But the problem is there are multiple types of people that are more detail-oriented than visionary founders. And some of them are gold for your business. And some of them are kryptonite for your business. And so what happens is we, we don't learn how to distinguish between those two. We just think, hey, this person's got a great resume. We usually don't even go that far. We think, hey, this person's got a pulse or they're related to somebody I know. Let's hire them. And, and in hiring the wrong people, uh, we are underwhelmed by their performance. Uh, we are overwhelmed by their needs, their management needs. And, and something inside us tells us, hey, this is just wrong, right? And, 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 and the way I describe it is we wake up thinking, what's wrong with these people? Yeah, it shouldn't be this hard to get people moving in the same direction. Uh, and this is where you'll see in the entrepreneurial world, uh, the, the term employees can get a really bad rap. You know, uh, there's a guy over here uh, on our neck of the woods, Dave Ramsey, says employees are folks who show up uh, late, leave early and expect a bigger paycheck. And, and, and there's this kind of bad view, this dim view of, of, uh, of employees. It's not that employees are bad people. It's not that being an employee is not a noble thing. It's not that you can't be an employee and a hard worker. It's that there are certain types of people who thrive in small business environments, and there are certain types of people who do not. And so here's, here's the general rule on, on how to do it. First off, 
we have names for them. We have a, an assessment on our website that helps you find these folks. But what we want in the early days, those first few employees especially, we want operators. And what operators do is they get stuff done. If you're out there looking for your first couple of folks, you don't want people who follow A to B to C. If there's a good way of skipping B and just getting straight to C and the customer's happy and we all, you know, we all stay out of jail. You want people who know how to effectively cut corners. You want people who are so concerned about getting the job done that they will do whatever it takes to make it happen. Now, there's another type of very detail-oriented person, and we call them a processor. And, and processors, they think in terms of system and process. They default to no. They need an excruciating level of detail, right, to, to be managed and to do their job well. And processors aren't as concerned about getting the thing done. They're not as concerned about doing the right thing. They're not, a, to them, whatever it takes is an admission of defeat, not a badge of honor. Processors are concerned about doing the thing the right way. And while that is a, a, a wonderful thing, I love processors, I am one of them, uh, what you have to recognize is you don't know enough about what the right way is early in an organization to give them what they need to succeed. So what you really want are, are those operator types. You want folks who are, who are finishers by nature. Uh, they, they are doers. They, they are uh, literal. They're action-oriented. They go make stuff happen. And what I found is founders who find those people, either by luck or by intentionality, they're the ones who break through that barrier you're talking right now faster than anyone. What's your thoughts on using kind of like Briggs Myers or the DISC system for hiring people, like the profiling yeah. systems? I love them. I, I, I've never used DISC uh, in a professional capacity. I've used it in a personal capacity. We used Myers Briggs extensively in the early days. Um, and uh, now I, I do all of my stuff through our framework. It's called the Synergist model. Um, and I, I highly recommend using them. Now, there's a right way of using them in the hiring process, and there's a wrong way. The wrong way is you don't score perfectly what I want. I'm not even going to talk to you. That, that's not appropriate. That's actually illegal here in the United States. Um, but the right way of using it is saying, hey, I want to understand how you tick so that I can ask great questions when we talk together. When I do our interview, I can ask great questions. I can ask insightful questions to find out whether or not you will thrive in this role, right? So uh, using them that way, if you use them to ask great questions, I think they are an absolutely essential piece of a great interviewing and hiring process. And like you know, Ryan mentioned, one of those, how, the, the things that can go wrong with employees, the things that can go right. I mean, like when I worked in Ireland, I was working for a company and like I had about 200 people under me. And I found that at times I felt like I was in agony and trying to get the best people. If you know there was something wrong in a relationship or stuff like that, and that's why I was trying, just trying to keep all the cogs moving. But then I moved to Poland. I'm 17 years here. And at one stage, there were about 14 people working for me. But what I saw happening to me and also with people I know, that in Poland, when a woman gets pregnant, after about a month, they go out on maternity leave. And you have to pay, you know, not only the first month, but then the kind of social system kicks in. But you also have to pay their holidays. And they could go out for two or three years. And I have seen companies, ser it didn't happen to me, I was okay the way, but I've seen other companies seriously struggle because a few people would go out. And it's, I don't know why they do it here, because in Ireland, like, you know, you can be eight months pregnant before people kind of decide to say, okay, no, it's time to kind of <laughs> go home and just relax. And the people then have a major cash flow issue. And then you look at the kind of alternative, which, I mean, me personally, when I had a lot of people, I just felt... I'm managing people. I'm kind of trying to get the best out of them, educating them and everything, and they're not even realizing what I'm trying to do. And I got to the stage where I don't want no more employees. But then I was kind of like, you know, different businesses over the years, I'd get, you know, I outsource. And what I found is at the start, fantastic. Everything was going grand. And I don't like to micromanage. I like to go, this is what you're doing. And as soon as I kind of go away and do my own thing, then they're, they drop. And it's kind of like, trying to find the magic time to when you are outsourcing or with the employees it's just like to touch that 
And then that's that's the, that's what happens a lot. So two big things there. One is the American system and most systems in 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 Europe are very different with respect to the entrepreneur's requ- response social responsibility, and uh, and so. Uh, the American system is much more pro entrepreneur. I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it it it's much. Uh, most of those requirements are not placed on organizations under 50 employees uh, here for that very reason. So uh, that that is something I appreciate about the system. It it still makes it very hard. Uh, and and what happens here in the U.S. is that it, it doesn't empower entrepreneurs to ignore the social challenges. It empowers them to to help contribute to solving the ones that they're capable of solving, right? And so what you see is you'll see very generous uh, policies from from entrepreneurs who that's a, a key point for them. That that's a key part of their value system. So um, it, it it is, I, and I think that's an appropriate thing for people to really look at. Is Yes, we need social safety nets. Yes, we need to take care of um, of you know, the disadvantaged. We need to take care of families. But we have to look at what the cost is of that on society. And I think part of why we have such a vibrant entrepreneurial community here relative to many other parts of the world is because those small organizations are protected from some of those responsibilities. Uh, second thing there, uh, yes, uh, there is a need for as a visionary to learn the skills of management, right? It is a skill set. It's not a wiring. Now, some people are more naturally uh, prone to that skill set. But what we have to look at, what we have to recognize is that as a founder in that 10 to 15 space, the, the number one way to grow your business is to make sure we are winning right? Not I am winning. We have to make sure that we are winning. And for founders, that's hard because they think they are the business. So if they're not winning, then we are not winning. You got to turn that around. If we are not winning, then I'm not winning. And and what that does is when we start using that and say, hey, I've got to make sure my whole, I have to make sure we are winning. You look at your calendar and say, what does my calendar need to look like to make sure my people have what they need to succeed? Uh, when we we look at our, our resource allocation, when we look at how we spend our time, when we look at the, the skills that we're developing, if we can shift that focus to we, uh, I win when we win, it makes it a lot easier to, to value that ongoing management. It's not micromanagement. I'm not saying you got to be in there holding their hand every step of the way, but you've got to continue. When you get strong operators, they need strong visionaries to help kind of keep them on the rails. They need to keep them moving toward the same vision. They need to keep them inspired to do their best work. Those are all appropriate things to do. And so management, again, it's not what founders are, are uh, born to do. It's not what they they love to do. But it is, it is an important and essential skill set until you are big enough to have somebody else do it for you. And, and that's, that's the key distinction for getting out of that stage three. I actually call it the reluctant manager. To getting into stage four, where we can become the coach on the sideline, where we can really start to pour into where this organization is going, not just where it is, is do we have a great manager in place to partner up with, right? Do we have a great number two who can carry the thing forward with us, uh, who can keep the trains running on time while we go out and forge new territory? Uh, So... We, you can't just jump straight there. You can't just go, hey, I don't want to manage. We're going to hire somebody because you don't know how to hold them accountable because you've never figured out how to manage yourself. But if you can learn some of the basic skills of management and then from there prioritize building someone else into that role where they can handle the ongoing management for you, that's the secret sauce. Most uh, entrepreneurs are kind of optimistic about what they're doing and, and it's just it, like... I had a lot of companies in Poland and when the crash happened, basically I was doing well, but the investors I was with didn't. And eventually the whole lot came down with a car- deck of cards and I didn't, I wasn't aware of it because nobody, the solicitors, the accountants didn't tell me, but when you were the president of the company, I was president of a lot of companies, you're personally liable. So I was personally liable for 5 million instead of making 5 million. But what I see with a lot of kind of entrepreneurs is because they're so optimistic, they give personal guarantees or they're maximizing their credit cards, which I think is very dangerous. And I just like you to touch on that. 
Yeah, it's it's one of the places, and it's, it's just one example of many, where the entrepreneurial journey is not a business endeavor. It's every bit as much a personal endeavor. And, and that's what I think a lot of people don't really recognize from the outside. It's, a, it's something that a lot of entrepreneurs don't actually value when they're in it is it, it is a very real personal journey that you're going through from the rejection that you face to the risks that you take. And yes, um, there, there's an element of entrepreneurism, just it, it brings risk with it, right? You talked about the definition of an entrepreneur as someone who goes from working 40 hours for someone else to working 80 hours for themselves. And you said getting paid half of what they were beforehand. That, that's risky, right? Here in the US, somewhere around 60 to 80% of new businesses fail. Uh, that, that's risky. That's just inherently risky. So the folks that make it, uh, they, they make it because they were willing to take that kind of risk. And, and again, this is why asking the question when, understanding how these stages work is, is, is so vitally important to how we even manage risk. Because early on, everything you do is risky, right? Every, like everything you do is risky from I'm going to make that call and get totally rejected. That's risky to, uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to quit my job so that I can start this business. That's risky. What we have to do, though, is as we take those risks, we need to make sure those risks are pointing us toward a successful conclusion. Uh, and, and as we start to get into the next stage, when, when we get more opportunities and the, the debt numbers start getting bigger and the personal guarantees get larger, we've actually got to learn a new skill set, which is saying no. Right when it's early, anyone who wants to pay you for anything, you say yes. Yeah, you know, it's a yes. And I haven't even told you what I want yet. Yes, like I'll do it. And 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 so we develop the skill of saying yes to survive. And then what happens as you create success is create is success creates more opportunities. So more things come your way. But we haven't really learned how to vet those opportunities and say no appropriately. We've only learned how to say yes and somehow make it all happen. And so what, you, what you're talking about there is as you continue to have success, as you move from needing to take risks to survive to getting to take risks to thrive, you have to develop the skill set of saying no. You have to, dis to develop your own decision-making framework or borrow someone else's for how to vet these new opportunities. Because I guarantee you, more opportunity will come to you than you can ever possibly achieve. And if you use debt to artificially inflate your ability to achieve all those opportunities, you're right. You are running a very, very risky business. You are running, you're building a house of cards and, and one little blip anywhere, right? And that was a big blip, but you get a little blip in that. You know, I can tell you a lot of stories about a lot of people who are making a lot of money and lost it all. And I think as well, not my situation, but even, you know, when people are taking on the debt and they're kind of being optimistic or they put the house on the line and they might have a family, sometimes the stress of that is is what's holding them back. That, you know, the creativity disappears, they're going into panic mode. And, and that's right. Uh, and, and debt is a symptom of that. But, but quite frankly, I, I see the exact same thing happen without debt. Now, I think debt adds an extra pressure. It deepens the hole. It makes it harder. But the stage is the same for everybody. Uh, and and the, the fourth stage of this journey uh, is where you become the coach on the sideline, which sounds wonderful. But the business equivalent of that, I call the disillusioned leader. So what happens is you're just driving, right? It's it's maybe, you know, five years and maybe it's a little less, maybe it's a little bit more, but you've, maybe it's 15 years. You've been doing this for a while. You're getting success from an outside perspective, right? Someone looks at you running a $5 million business and they think, yeah, everyone should be celebrating you. Uh, but you're looking at it and, and around this point, not only, uh, you know, if you've gone with a lot of debt, you've got a lot of debt, but the problems inside the business are really starting to stack up. Uh, it, it's, it's harder to find that next bucket of profitable revenue, right? So revenue is going up, but profit is, is oftentimes going down. That's a normal stage of the process. So while profit's going down, if you've got a debt load that's dependent on that profit to cover it, you're going to find yourself in trouble very quickly. 
when profit goes down, the intensity dials up. When the intensity dials up, the friction between team players uh, starts to dial up as well. So not only are you having financial challenges, you're having relational challenges as well. And 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 when all of that stress builds up, that it doesn't just stay at work. It goes home with you. And you see founders having trouble with their marriages and with their children. And And what happens is, uh, again, we kind of wake up with this question like, is this it? Is this really why I took all this risk? Did I really bring on all this debt just to be in this hamster wheel, right? D did I really spend the last 5, 10, 15 years of my life building a business to be this stressed out? And uh, it's kind of like, uh, have you seen the movie uh, Top Gun Maverick? Yeah. You know, the new one that's out? So. I like to use this as an illustration because we had a funny experience with it. Uh, we have uh, our kids are 12, 10, and 2 right now. It's a pretty big gap. Uh, they were younger at this point. And it's really hard to find a babysitter when you have a, I think they were 10, 8, and 0 at the time, right? Who can come in and handle a 10 year old and an 8 year old who are wide open? Those boys are, they, they, they will move. Uh, and a little infant. So just hard to get babysitters. I'm going somewhere with this. Uh, we, my wife and I decided we're moving heaven and earth. We're going to make a way. We're going to find s folks who can take the, the kids. Uh, we're going to get a babysitter and we're going to go out and we're just going to have a night together. So we, we, we do it. We get a babysitter. Uh, we go out and we watch Top Gun Maverick and it's fun. You know, it's all the, like, uh, the, the nostalgia, you know, the way they tied it into the old movie. It's really cool. And, and as we're watching it, right, like Tom Cruise is having a really bad go of it. You know, he, 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 if you watch the, the first, you know, 90% of the movie, really, it's pretty bad. He doesn't have the girl. You know, he's got the relationship strains with the, the son of his former wingman. Uh, they're, they're trying to achieve an impossible mission. He's failed as a trainer. Uh, he's washed up as a pilot. His bosses hate him. Like, if you stop the movie there, it's pretty depressing. And that's what happened. We got an SOS call from the babysitter saying, hey, I, I need you to come. And now everyone was healthy. Everyone was okay. But I missed the last probably 15, 20 minutes of Top Gun Maverick. And and as I was kind of looking back on it, you know, after we got home and we got everyone to bed, I was kind of like, man, that that, that movie was, was kind of it was sad right like there's a lot of stuff that went wrong like tom you know, tom's been shot down i think twice by this point in the movie uh he's been chased by helicopters you know he's fighting with his his you know his again his wingman son it's just when you stop any great movie take any epic movie you stop it about 10 15 minutes before the end and it's downright miserable anything that can go wrong has gone wrong to this point it looks like all hope is lost but you and I have watched enough movies to know it doesn't end there. And what happens for founders who are asking that is this it question, they're all the way down in the bottom of that story. That's the hardest point for any founder. And again, like you're talking about, that debt just makes it an even deeper, even harder hole. But the reality of it is, and I've worked with so many folks, I've seen it happen time and time again, that is not the end of the story. In fact, you're actually only one step away from the biggest transformation, the heroic ending, you know, the denouement. You, you are set for the biggest personal, personal and organizational step that you need to take. But you've got to know what the right steps are to do it, and you can't do it alone. Well, 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 well. You mentioned at the start how oh, you managed to get all these massive and all this, getting a lot of companies formed and everything, and I was using the Google. Google has kind of changed, and I, I mean, a lot of clients even that I'm working with and everything, I know there's, there's one in particular, and basically his business was just on Google Ads, and overnight it just stopped. And like with with things like that, same with Facebook and and, and they've both been caught. Facebook and Google have been caught lying about the numbers and everything because they're basically extracting as much money out of you as they can, and then they're getting each other to compete. So it's a different market than it was, you know, ten years ago. For the kind of paid ads and organic ads, because I mean, it's irre irrelevant what type of business you've got, you still need people to come to your door. What's your thought? What's the best way to be kind of getting going in that yeah. one? not an ads guru uh I, you know i know what worked for us that was 10 years ago so um 
you know, I, I don't pretend to know what it is. Uh, what I do recognize when I look at my clients and how they're succeeding, some of them use Google ads, some of them don't. Some of them use Facebook ads, some of them don't. Uh, what I've found tends to be the, the kind of secret that underlies it isn't any one perfect strategy. There's no one perfect acquisition source. In fact, the problem is having one acquisition source. When I look at companies who achieve what we call predictable success, the ability to scale up, they never do it on a single acquisition source. Uh, in, in fact, the vast majority of the time, they have three. They have three. So if you're running a Google AdWords campaign, uh, then you've got you know your, your paid search, uh, you've got referrals, and, uh, and then pick your third one, right? Uh, organic search or Facebook ads or something. And so what you need to do is it's, it's effective early on to develop that single strategy. But again, that same point when we're moving from surviving to thriving, that's when you need to start producing other acquisition channels. You need to start looking at things like podcasts or, or speaking or, um, uh, or networking or, you know, really ramping up your referral engine or what I call institutional referrals, where you go to other providers and work out either joint ventures or referral arrangements. You've got to find, you have to diversify your acquisition source. Because I am yet to see someone sustainably scale on a, sing a single source. Excellent. And just like on the exit strategies then, because, you know, like I think the best way is kind of in, in your mind, know exactly what's the whole end game. But I know that you've been involved with kind of nonprofit startups as well. And that's kind of different because they wanted to kind of survive them. So what's the kind of exit strategies, tips that you could give people? You know, there's lots of ways to exit, and, and it's not so much that there's a right or wrong way. Um, the folks that I tend to work with, again, because of my nonprofit background and because of even the for-profit businesses that I, I work with, I tend to work with a lot of founders uh, who who are really, really passionate about their business. And so that desire to see it live on, it, it tends to be true of, of the folks that I work with. I, I don't work with a lot of folks who are flipping stuff, for example. There's nothing wrong with that. It's an effective strategy you're welcome to it. That just doesn't tend to be who I work with. The folks that I work with and how we approach exit planning is much more about succession, right? And one of the really cool things is we get, you know, we get great returns on that. Every bit as great as the flippers are getting and, and oftentimes even more because the things that you need to do to build a company or a nonprofit that is capable of effective succession is a, a highly, highly desirable organization, right? Uh, you will find it's much easier if you're a nonprofit to bring in or raise up a new leader if you've done the work of structuring it properly so it's ready. So when we're looking at it, uh, uh, we're looking at it first with what are your goals, right? Because most founders, you know, if they if they eke out another hundred thousand dollars on the deal, it's really just an ego thing. It, it, it's not, uh, you know, it's not necessarily going to change their lifestyle. If you're going to sell your business for ten million. Ten million one hundred thousand dollars is a distinction without a difference. It's it's almost a rounding error. So, if you just go after maximizing your multiple, uh, it it's gonna leave you a little short sighted, and it's yeah, I found it leaves people a little disappointed. If you go about maximizing the value of your organization, right? If you maximize the value of your business, if you make it so that it can run without you. If you find another visionary leader who can not only lead it toward your vision for the future, but can build on your vision and take it even further, you will get a great multiple on that. And so what I help folks do is to really dial in on, hey, what's important to me? Uh, and, and for most of my clients, this isn't right or wrong, but for most of my clients, the folks who come to me, they resonate with the idea that it's important to me that this, that this organization thrive when I'm gone. And, and so to do that, uh, succession is the main ingredient there. You have to build a company or organization that is capable of succession. It's not dependent on you. And then the second thing, and this takes a while, Jack Welch, for the last five years of his tenure at GE, he was dedicated to this idea of succession. He said, my number one job as CEO is to find and develop my successor. And, and it's usually a multi-year process of finding and developing someone who, who not only can, can you know, pursue your vision, but who you trust to develop the next vision for your organization. 
Just uh, finally, Scott, uh, you're, you, you're a podcaster as well, so you might let people know what, what's the name and why you started it. Yeah. So uh, my podcast is called The Secrets of the High Demand Coach. Uh, and um, I, what I do is I, I interview some of the best coaches around the world uh, and, and get them to share their secrets, right? So uh, how, you know, what is it? If they could, uh, the question I love to ask every, anyone is, if, you know, what is the biggest secret you wish wasn't a secret at all? What's that one thing you wish everybody listening knew? And, and just the wisdom and the elegance and the brilliance of some of these folks. But uh, it, it's awesome. I learned so much in it. Uh, we get awesome feedback from our listeners. But why do I do that? Uh, so one of the things that happened to me as an entrepreneur uh, was, like many entrepreneurs, we just, I, m myself and my business partner, we're just like, hey, we're going to figure this out as we go, right? If we can't figure it out, you know, maybe nobody can. We're not going to spend money on a bunch of consultants. We're just going to, we're going to own this and we're going to figure it out. And that worked really great for quite a while. And then we started bumping into some challenges that we just could not solve. And so what we did, we, we kind of begrudgingly went out and started to look for folks who could help us. We hired a coach, we hired a consultant, we hired an advisor. And, and quite frankly, uh, we had a, an awful experience. Uh, they were wonderful people, but we lost more money following their advice than we did any other decision we ever made. And uh, some of that was because we hired the wrong people. Some of that was that they gave us, they answered the, the, we asked the wrong question. They answered that question, but they didn't have the wisdom or, or understanding or maybe even bravery to tell us that wasn't the right question to ask. And so they drove us further into the hole that we had. And the net result of that, you know, forget the million and a half we lost on it. The, the biggest cost of it was the feeling of isolation that we walked away with. We really walked away with that. Is this it? Like, is this as far as it can go? If we can't figure it out and we can't hire some, some of the you know, smartest people that we can find and they can't figure it out, then nobody can. And, and what, what I found is, you know, and now that I'm in coaching and consulting, I travel across the United States talking to founders and CEOs, and I've asked them, I said, how many of you have had a coach? And, and surprisingly, like nine out of 10 have, will, will raise their hand in most audiences. And uh, it shocked me at first, but then I started like getting stories and recognizing other people were having bad experiences with coaches. So I went out and, and, and started asking as well, how many of you who've had a coach have had a bad experience with a coach? Uh, you know, similar to mine, nine out of 10. Nine out of 10 people had had a bad experience with a coach. And, and so the heart of the podcast is I want to, to really show folks what a great coach looks like, because there's a couple of things we need to do. We need to make sure that we're actually going out and finding the right coach for where we are right now. And by bringing in these great coaches who've been doing this for years, many of them decades, they know who they can help and who they can't help. And, and so, the, again, the heart and passion behind it is to bring great coaches, let them share their wisdom, but to really help model what a great coach looks like. So when someone's feeling stuck, the founder or entrepreneur, they know who to go out and find. They know what to look for in a great coach. Right. Well, listen, Scott, totally enjoyed the conversation. You might let people know where they can find you. Yeah. Best place uh, is to head on over to scalearchitects.com forward slash founders. Uh, the stages that we've talked about here today and, and the other five that we really didn't even get to uh, are all in a, a book that we have available for free on the website. So you can get a free copy at scalearchitects.com slash founders. If you love, love what you hear uh, here or you want to check out the podcast, uh, we've got it all on our social media account. Anywhere you go uh, at Scott Ritzheimer, you'll, you'll be able to track me down. I'll make sure I put all the links put on the audio and the video. Thank you very much, Scott. So that's all for the Speaking Podcast. You'll find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. Until next week, take care. So I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. As mentioned at the start, you can find my six podcasts on RoyCollin.com or scan the QR code. If you're looking to start a podcast or do a podcasting tour, help with that. Also, if you're looking for a virtual assistant, we also have that service. And you can help the show by visiting the store, supporting our sponsors, or making a donation. Until next week, take care.